At the beginning of the conference, we were reminded that revivals often come in 50-year cycles, and uh, the speaker did to give some uh, background to that, and that is what I found over the years, sometimes sooner than 50-year cycles, depending on the prayer and holiness that is uh, being exercised. But I'd like to state that uh, although we've been long overdue for a year of Jubilee, you remember in the Old Testament, it was a time every 50 years where slaves were set free, where the land had rest and people regained their inheritances. Uh, We're long overdue for that, but I would like to suggest, and I believe that when God sends revival, it's not going to be a nationwide revival as we've seen in the past. My thought is, as I've been praying about this, that revival has already begun. It's already begun. Do not despise the day of small things. It's begun in Canada, in certain places. It's begun in the U.S., in the Western world, all around the world. But it, God is doing something different. He is putting new wine into new wineskins because with the coming oppression, with the one world government, and with the new regulations that are being imposed in the U.S. and Canada and elsewhere... The church, at one point, is going to be underground. I mean, isn't that a praise the Lord? In China, in in Seoul, Korea, wherever the church has been oppressed, that's when she really grows and is revived. So, to get us there, God is going to do a work in individual lives, and I'll explain more about that as we go. My text this morning is found in Psalm 85.6, where God asks the question, and the psalmist, rather, asks the question, Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? It's not enough for countries around the world in the past to have been revived. It's not enough for us personally to have been revived in the last year or even in the last month. The psalmist asked the question, will you not revive us again? We don't have to wait for the person sitting beside us to get revived. We don't have to wait for our husband and wife or our pastor or the leaders or someone else to get revived. God can give revival to each one of us if we'll listen to what He says through His Word. I can guarantee tomorrow morning you will not pick up the New York Times and see that revival came to Kindlin on the first page. You won't see that. But according to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3, Christ Himself will write not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God on tablets of human hearts. Revival has come to dot, 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 and you can put your name in there. One of the key words in this verse is the word again. As a matter of fact, in the preceding verses, in verses 2 to 4, in the same chapter, we read, You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. Restore us again, O God our Savior, and put away your displeasure toward us. Now in verse 2, it's talking about people who are Christians. They're saved. Their sins are forgiven. That's the doctrine of justification. God's wrath is satisfied. That's the doctrine of propitiation. And yet there is a need for us to be restored in verse 4 and to be revived again in verse 6. Now this brings up a critical point about our walk as Christians. And that is that as Christians and as churches... Once we are saved, we need to be constantly revived and restored to God. Now, when I was younger, I used to think that my spiritual gift was backsliding. And uh, I've learned as I've gotten older that I just get a little more subtle in my backsliding and I can do it uh, in ways that are very creative. And I've realized and God has shown me the need for constant brokenness in my life. All we have to do is look at the powerlessness and the condition of our churches to know that we are in desperate need of revival continuously. Now the obvious question this afternoon would be, well, how do we get revived? But I don't want to ask the obvious question this afternoon. Instead, I want to ask that question in a different way. 
The question is this, how does a person get unrevived? Because in understanding how we get unrevived, we'll know how we're to get back to being revived. The answer is found at the end of verse 6. Will you not revive us again that what your people may do what? Rejoice in you. We fall into a backslidden or unrevived state when we no longer find our joy in the Lord. When we no longer love Him. When we find more joy in the things of this world, in relationships, in money, in possessions, in hobbies, in interests, in good things, in success, in power, or position, or lustful pleasures, more lo joy in these things than in Christ. Jeremiah 2.12, the prophet said, Be appalled at this, O heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me. That's bad enough. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Now this forsaking of God not only happened in the, New Te or the Old Testament, it happens and happened in the New Testament as well. As well. We read in Revelation chapter 2 that the Christians there had not just lost their first love. We often... Tell people, oh, you've lost your first love. No, that's not what Scripture says. They left their first love because they loved something or someone else more than the Lord Jesus. And that's the way, folks, we become unrevived. We love someone or something. We stop loving the Lord Jesus Christ with all of our hearts and souls, and mind, and strength, and we become unrevived, and therefore we break the first commandment, which is to what? Have no other gods before Him. And when we start loving something or someone more than the Lord, and we break the first commandment, the rest fall like a house of cards. You see, that's the problem in our churches. We preach pe the people what to do and what not to do. Do's and don'ts. And if you want to be revived, you do this and this and this and this. And we miss the first point, which is have no other gods. Because when God has my heart, He has all of me. Amen. The way to revival is finding our joy and love in the Lord again. Let me pause for a moment on this point. This is called a revival conference. I've preached at other revival conferences. But whether revival sweeps the eastern seaboard as it did in 1857 with Jeremiah Lamphere where a group of men met on Wall Street and then you know the story from there. It is estimated that close to 2 million people across the nation came to Christ as a result of that re revival. 2 million whether God sweeps the eastern seaboard as He did in 1857, or whether God revives one man, one woman, or a group of people, revival can come. Revival takes place when I repent of my sin, of rejoicing in other things, and loving other things, and rejoicing in other things more than loving and rejoicing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Over the years, I've witnessed many individual revivals in individual people in small pockets and churches. And I'll share testimonies about that in a few minutes, but I want to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that a deep love for God, not just conviction of sin or convicting messages or prayer alone is necessary if God is to send personal or corporate revival. Many of you have read of the Welsh Revival that took place in the early 1900s where 100,000 people were saved. That revival was criticized later by some, by some uh, theologians as a, as a false revival because they said at the end of, what was it, about a decade that, that 10,000 people could be found in church, but 90,000 stuck. 
Can you imagine that? What are our statistics today from altar calls? 2% bark on the door of a church after altar calls and great evangelistic meetings? 2% after one year? And the one event that God wanted people to remember that sparked the, the revival in 1904 took place on the second Sunday of February in that same year after the morning service. And the pastor, Joseph Jenkins, invited the young people into the vestry at the back of the church to have a meeting after he preached. And he asked them this question. He said, tell me, what is God doing in your life? Well, someone stood up and began to preach. Another person stood up and shared some scripture. And Jenkins said, no, tell me what God is doing in your life. Is He real to you? And then a 19-year-old girl by the name of Flory Evans stood up. She was a fairly new Christian. And she said this, I am unable to say very much today, but I love the Lord Jesus with all my heart. He died for me. And those words ignited a flame that was to lead eventually to national and international revival. And God confounded the wisdom of the wise by not using a theologian, nor a pastor, nor a revival preacher, but a teenage girl who is fairly new to the faith to spark one of the most powerful revivals the world has ever seen. Not with fancy words or theatrics, but in simplicity and sincerity, expressing her deep love for the Lord Jesus. Is this not what the psalmist meant when he said in Psalm 51.12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Why? So that I could just feel good? Listen, next verse. Then, once I found my joy in you, once I love you, Lord Jesus, get this. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Have you ever considered that the most effective way to see people saved and backsliders turn back to God is through the example, through the words, through the teaching and preaching who are filled with joy and love for the Lord? I remember years ago when a church I pastored it became very obvious that we were just playing church. I remember when I came on board the elders and the deacons met and they gave me this great big thick manual. It must have been about that thick. And I said, what's this? They said, it's a church growth strategy and plan. In other words, they had told God what He was going to do in the church, right? It was a marvel to angels and pets. Like, I don't know what, the, this thing, I remember one of the elders, he was on board with me, he says, let's hide the thing. We hid it. They never asked for it again. But I remember looking at all these things God was going to save. It was a small church. I started, I guess there was about 90 people when I started. But it, they, 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 four people a year and so many baptized and all of this. And uh, God wasn't doing what we told Him to do. God, sometimes God doesn't do that. And so... I, I, God burdened my heart that we needed revival. I, I didn't know what to call it back then. I just need, I knew we needed God. Without me, you can do nothing. And it's not by might or by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So I figured, well, if the Holy Spirit doesn't do something, then, then we're wasting our time. And so I began to pray, and I prayed that God, that according to Zechariah 12.10, that His spirit of grace and supplication would fall on another man in the church. Just one man, one, one man on the elders board. By the way, uh, in my elders meeting, none of the elders would come to prayer meeting. One man every once in a while at a guilt would come. So I said it, quoted from, from Acts and said, you know, they devoted themselves to the preaching of the word and to prayer. And I said, well, if we want to be elders, we've got to pray. If you're too busy to pray, then you can't be elders. But look, I just trust God will burden your heart. They all resigned except for one man. All of them. I was left with this one man, Dave. And he said, what are we going to do? I said, well, we're going to pray. We're going to get right with God. And so I began praying. And uh, 
I would just seek the Lord. I said, Lord, I can't do this. I, I can't do this. The, like, the, I, I looked out every Sunday in the Valley of Dry Bones. Any pastors know what that's like? I was trying to make corpses dance. You ever try to make corpses dance? That's what we do in our churches. We get them to read a sinner's prayer, and then we try to make that corpse dance. They'd never be regenerated. You, we'd say, if you believe in God, you would say, the demons believe and tremble. So I began praying for that man, and one day I got a call, and he was a controller of an engineering company, and, and I didn't know who was on the other end. There was weeping on the phone. And I said, who is this? He says, it's Dave. I said, Dave, what happened? What, what tragedy has befallen you? He says, I'm at work and the Holy Spirit is on me. I'm convicted of my sin. I, he says, I'm behind my desk on my face. I said, is your door shut? He had a corner office with doors. I, he, I, was, he's, I just want to think, man, shut the door before he gets kicked out. And then he can't support me in the church, right? <laughs> Selfishness. Oh, he said, shut the door. He said, it's okay. The doors are locked. I, I said, and, he's, and he was being broken over his sin. I said, come over after work and uh, we'll pray. And he came over that night. And we prayed and we prayed that God would rend the heavens and that the, the sky of brass... And bronze over us in our area there in Toronto would just be broken and God would move to save people. We began praying. We, 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 there was only two of us. We didn't need elders meetings. We just prayed. Every, it didn't, we, we had no set time. Sometimes in the morning, sometimes at night. No set time. We just prayed until the Lord showed us to stop. And then one other man joined the board. He became burdened. And then the three of us began to pray. That was for three months. We began to pray. And our prayer was, may your spirit of grace and supplication fall on your people to pray. You, you can't orchestrate this. You can't strategize this. We went to a retreat with all the men in the church. And, and I don't even remember what the speaker was talking about. But after we got out, we were standing on the veranda. It was up north. And there were about 17 men there. And one of them just said, Mark, I'm burdened. As men, we should start praying together in small groups. Those men covenanted, and every week they got together to pray and pray. But you know what was very interesting? They loved the Lord. That was the first thing God did in our hearts, was to give us a love for the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we quote that verse in Romans 5, 5, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Spirit that He's given us. It took me a long time to figure out what that meant actually yesterday, if I'd be honest. I was in the parking lot weeping and God laid this on my heart. He says, you know why I shed the Holy Spirit in your heart with love? It's not so you can feel loved. And it's not even so you can love others. It's so that you can love the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why I shed my love abroad in your heart. And these men got it. They began expressing their love for the Lord but after they had confessed their sins. And after three months, these men were transformed by the Spirit of God. And their wives started coming up to me. And I remember one wife saying, Do you think that your wife could start a prayer meeting for the ladies in this church? Because our husbands have now left us in the dust spiritually. Now when women say that their husbands have left them in the dust, you know God's up to something. That was after six months, and I'll never forget the day God came. It was on December 31st, 1992. We didn't do anything different. We had no evangelistic programs. We, we had no strategies. And one woman, her husband had died in the hospital. Just before he died, I had shared Christ with him, and he came to the Lord. He wasn't even in my uh, parish. There was another guy I went to visit. He was there. I said, well, he's a captive audience. He was too sick to leave the room, so I witnessed to him. And I started sharing with him the gospel. He comes to Christ, and I gave him a Bible, and his wife was mad at me. She was so mad because her husband was a good religious man. How dare I say that he's not saved? I had written my telephone number in, the, in his Bible. He had died. She had taken his personal effects. A year later, she calls me on December 31st. She says, are you the man who visited my husband in the hospital when he was dying? I said, yes. And I thought, oh boy, here it comes. She says, could you come visit me? I found his Bible, and I found your telephone number, 
and I want to talk with you. I went there that day, and I told her what happened, what I shared with her husband. Very simple, very simple gospel message, and I turned the Bible around to let her read. And something happened I'd never witnessed before. As she began to read, the Holy Spirit came on her in deep, deep conviction. And without me saying a word, without me asking her to pray a prayer, she just wept and repented and started to express her love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And she got saved after ten minutes of weeping. And I thought to myself, they didn't teach me this in seminary. That was the first. It started one, two, three, four a week. Every week. People, we would just give them the Bible. We would show them Scripture. They would weep and come out Christians. We said nothing. But all the while, people were praying and they were in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. 75% of our church was always in prayer. People would go, well, Mark's going out to witness someone. Let's pray for him. And while I was sharing the Gospel, people would get say, you know... I became a good Calvinist then, kind of. My friend always says, you know, what's the difference between Calvinists and Arminians? He said, Mark, believe like a Calvinist, but live like an Arminian. I liked what he said. I never forgot that. But irresistible grace. I saw irresistible grace. The Apostle Paul, he was on his way to Damascus, on his way on the road to Damascus, what? To throw Christians in the jail. Who knows what happened to them? Maybe some of them were killed. He wasn't going to revival meeting. Revival came to him. Why? The church was pleading to God, save that man. Give me souls or I die. Give me children. They were praying for him. How could he resist that? I remember one man, a Vietnamese man, he came to me. He'd just been newly saved outside of the church and he came in and we were discipling him a little bit. And uh, he said to me, he said, uh, Pastor, if you witness to my wife, she'd be saved. And I thought, okay. Uh, well, I said, I can't. Say, I said, I've never saved anyone before. He says, but people are getting saved. I said, yes, the Holy Spirit's saving them. I'll share with her, but I can't save anybody. So his English, now he speaks great English. But back then, he was just brand new off the boat. He was Buddhist background, gets saved, can't communicate. Her English was almost nil. And so we brought her over one night to have dinner on a Friday night. And I said to her, uh, Nellie, and she didn't want to be there. You know, you don't have to have discernment when you see. She just sat there. She wouldn't say anything. We couldn't get her to talk. Even with her husband translating, she didn't want to talk. So I said, well, I'll give this a shot since he actually brought her. I'll honor him. So I said, Nellie, your husband's so excited because he's found Jesus. And say, Let me tell you why he's excited. And I use that as the segue to share the gospel with her. And at the end, I said, Nellie, would you like to become a Christian? And she said, no. She didn't know how to say no in English. That was about the whole, very few words. And then I said, do you believe these things? And she said, no. Well, what do you do? Nothing. We changed the subject. And we're eating away. And all of a sudden, remember, people who love the Lord are praying. And she begins to cry. And she begins to weep. And she bows her head and she's weeping and weeping and weeping. And her husband starts talking to her in Vietnamese when she's able to compose herself. And he looks at me with a big smile. He says, Pastor, I have good news. She's under conviction of the Holy Spirit. She's under conviction of the Holy Spirit. No one said anything to her. She couldn't even understand me, folks. Do you see what God can do? She could not understand what I was saying to her. She wept, she repented, she got up with tears of joy, hugged us all, got saved. The last time I talked to her, almost all of her Buddhist family is now saved. Restored to me the joy of your salvation. What happens then? Then I will teach transgressors your way, and sinners will turn back to you. And she, they go with that. Let's have a run. Let's just fall in love with Jesus, and guess what? He'll use us. You see, the coming revival is not going to be a mass sweeping one across the country, because then we're sitting ducks. It's going to happen more and more underground. It's going to happen in pockets. God has reserved 7,000, more than 7,000, I say 7 million maybe, who have not bowed the knee to veil. And God is going to find them. God is going to move in those hearts. And some of you are right here today. I 
I, you, I hope you don't mind. So you, you don't mind stories. I mean, this is God. God's doing it. It had nothing to do with this. As a matter of fact, we remember we, God would do the most amazing things. We at the back of the church on a Sunday, I'd meet someone I'd never seen them before, and I'd say, "Welcome to our church. Where are you from?" They said, "Nowhere." I, uh, well, we live here in the city. I said, well, why did you come today? They said, these are unsaved people. We don't know. God woke us up and told us to come. Amen. Listen, well, how, do you, well, how do you organize an outreach like that? Just pray. Fall in love with the Lord. And then they get saved. I, I remember we had this saying, the elders, I think it was Lee Trevino one day, he was getting ready to tee off on the, you know, one of his tournaments. And it was starting to get cloudy, and as soon as he put up his driver, boom, he got struck with lightning right down the road, and he was unconscious. They took him to the hospital, and after he revived, uh, one of the reporters says, Mr. Trevino, what did you learn through this event? And he says, when God wants to play through, you let him play through. And that's what the elders would pray. I remember, my God, they, oh God, just help us stay out of the way. We're scared. We were scared. We didn't know what to do anymore. We just stand away. God would save people. I remember so many people were getting saved at one time. I used to pray this. Lord, save this person, but just not tonight. I don't have time. I had no assistant pastor. I had no time. People would come. They would knock on our doors 10 o'clock at night. People would be there to 2, 3, and 4 in the morning. They'd be getting saved. I remember one man, he kept begging me, begging me, Oh, I want to get saved. I want to get saved. I said, you're not ready to get saved. And I, you know, a few times I told him, you're not ready, I'm not, I'm not leading you to the Lord tonight. One night he came, he was so desperate, he says, I need to get saved tonight. This was at 2 in the morning. I said, you've got idols. I said, you're too rich to get saved. I said, it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich man. You've got too much money. He says, I don't care about my money. God can take it all. I've got to get saved tonight. He fell on his knees, he got saved. I remember... An NHL hockey player. Hey, this, I mean, unsaved people were leading people to Christ. Now that's... I didn't know that could happen. Did you know that? We had one man in the church. I'll never forget. He reminded me of Eeyore. Because, you know, Eeyore and Winnie the Pooh? You know, uh, you could say, oh, you know, but it, it isn't in a great day. Yeah, but it'll probably rain. I mean, everything. He talked like that, too. He was the most negative person I ever met in my life. He wouldn't get saved. One day he says, Mark, I'm bringing one of the Canadian NHL ho uh, hockey players from Boston Bruins up to counsel with you. This man's been going to psychiatrists and psychologists, and no one can help him. But if you talk to him, you'll help him. I said, I can't help anybody. Well, anyways, this guy flies up from Boston, and he was, he was a, you know, a defenseman. I mean, everyone here looks bigger than me, but this guy looked bigger than me. I mean, he's huge. Comes in, and I said, he says, I need help. And he just looked really intense at me. He says, I need help. And I said, what do you need help about? He says, I've come up, and I'm going to kill my parents. And I'm thinking, did he say parents or pastor? Parents or pastor? I don't know. I'm thinking, oh, no. Lord, have mercy on This guy's big. He just squashed me like a grape. So I said, I was going to the backyard. He's big, but I'm fast, and I'm going to run. I'm going to get on a picnic table. I can get out of here real fast. So his unsafe friend follows him to the back. And that morning, the, the Holy Spirit led me to this obscure passage in Romans. I, I never used it for witnessing. And I remember thinking, those are interesting verses. And I, I was kind of perplexed. As I was sitting at the, the picnic table, I was going to turn to another passage. And the Holy Spirit said, no, show him what you read this morning. I'm used to this by now. So I turned the Bible around to him. And I said to him, Sean, start reading here. Three verses in, to, I still don't know where it was, three verses into that chapter, he began to weep uncontrollably. And ten minutes later, the tears of joy. He got up, he gave me a bear hug. I still have a, a, a displaced disc, I think, in my back uh, from that. He just about killed me. And he was just rejoicing. He was so excited. And his friend, Eeyore there, looked at me with his baptized in pickle juice look. And I said, what are you so I'm, I'm, I'm upset about? He says, because God saved him and he hasn't saved me yet. I said, that's because you're too proud. Humble yourself and God will save you too. So as they're leaving, I figured, well, who's going to disciple this guy? That was one of the guys, by the way, I said, Lord, save him, but not today. But anyways, God didn't listen to me. See, he doesn't listen to strategic plans and he doesn't even listen to our selfish prayers sometimes. So I said to this fellow, Eeyore, uh, 
Not his real name. Uh, I said, give me, his tel- give me Sean's telephone number. I need to disciple him. He, he says, no. He was so upset that his friend got saved. He, he didn't give me his telephone number. So I said, Lord, I don't have time anyway. Just bless him. Just bless him. Disciple. Three years later, we had a revival speaker by the name of Dick Sipley. He was part of the 72 revival in, in uh, Saskatoon, which went into the Midwest and then did go around the world in different pockets. Powerful move of God in the 70s. And he was preaching uh, three years later after this event. And sure enough, I'm at the back to greet uh, people with Dick. And this man comes, this big guy comes down and he said, Mark, do you remember me? I said, no. He says, I got saved on your picnic table three years ago. I said, Sean, what are you doing now? He says, I just wanted to let you know, after I left, I went to another church. They discipled me there, and I'm graduating from Bible college. I'm going into the pastorate. You see, when God wants to play through, you let him play through. I've just given you a few stories. I I don't have time to tell you the most amazing uh, salvations I've ever seen. But I want to tell you this. There was no human fingerprint on one of them. No one. God could use Balaam's donkey. He can use us. What I do know is that we love the Lord Jesus. And transgressors turned back to him, and sinners were saved. That's revival. You see, the Lord cares about our hearts above everything else. That's why in Proverbs, he doesn't say, My son, give me your money, your talents, your hard work, your ministry. He says, My son, give me your heart. You see, the Pharisees gave all these other things to the Lord. But they never gave Him their hearts. And that's why Jesus said, these people, they honor Me with their lips. And I might add their laws. There's 613 laws. But their hearts are far from Me. And that's why, folks, we never read about a revival in the Gospel in Jerusalem until the book of Acts with the Christians. If anyone should have had a revival, it was these religious people who were doing everything right and saying everything right. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the hearts. Jesus cares about my heart and your heart today. Was this not why Jesus did what He did when He restored Peter? How would a court of law have dealt with Peter after he sinned? Wow, they would have done a play-by-play reenactment of every nuance of his statements and the fact that he cursed with an oath and they would have dragged him through the whole thing again. But not Jesus. All those things didn't matter. Do you know what? The Lord... I want to be careful here. The Lord is not so much concerned about our sin as our hearts once we recognize we've sinned. I'm going to explain this more lest you think I'm uh, preaching heresy here. I want to be careful. But he could have brought Peter up on his sin and us on our sin today. And you know what? He didn't do that. He didn't say, Peter, how could you have humiliated me and yourself by denying me? All Jesus wanted to know was this one thing. Peter, after all is said and done, and I don't have to tell you how you've sinned, do you love me more than these? Peter, do you love me more than everyone else around you? Peter, I don't care how good a fisherman you are. I don't care how good a leader you are. I don't care how great a preacher you are. Peter, all I care about is your heart. And Peter, if I'm going to use you, because I've prayed for you that after you've returned, strengthen your brothers. If I'm going to use you, Peter, I want you to know this. You've got to love me with all your heart. Can we be honest with God for a moment? If Jesus was to appear and say to each one of us individually right now, do you love me more than... He might bring up, for those who are listening on the internet, maybe it's a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Maybe it's a husband or a wife. Maybe it's a friend, a best friend. Maybe it's your child. 
maybe even a parent or an educator or someone you respect, what would you say? If he said, do you love me more than your money? More than your possessions? More than that car? What if he said, do you love me more than your goals? More than your plans? More than your retirement? You see, the answer to that question will determine whether God can revive our hearts and use us to touch others in revival. After we started a new work a year ago, God was to teach us more things. I've learned more things in the context of God moving to save and in, in, in these individual revivals than all my Bible college seminary reading put together. It's just amazing when you go into the school of God and realize how he's, He works things. Revival God's Way is the name of this conference. And I remember, we, we started, and we, again, I'm not that organized. Anyone that knows me, know, I, that's not my gift. Administration, it's not, I call it the curse of administration. I don't have the gift of administration. I'm no good at it. I leave that up to others. My wife's good at that. Others are. But we start at, people would come at 10 for coffee and we'd start preach from 10 to, or I guess we'd worship and, and then um, we'd be finished by noon and we'd have potluck, everyone would bring potluck, everyone ate together kind of like an axe and, and, and it did, it just kind of turned into an axe thing. We didn't plan it, but people wouldn't leave sometimes till midnight. For the first six months, no one would leave. They would stay, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night. The, the, our fridges were emptied every week. I mean, people would keep eating, they'd eat and talk, and afterwards, people would be praying, they'd be worshipping, they'd be encouraging one another. We didn't plan, it just started to happen. But there was love. Everyone that came in said that this was the most loving fellowship they ever saw. And I remember one man, <laughs> we had poachers in our church. We had someone that was going to another church, they, they go to two services, they go to this big church, and then they come to ours. So they're at this big church, and, and the pastor says, all of you should be in cell groups, home churches. So he turns around and he talks to one of these ladies in our church and she says, would you like to come to Home Fellowship? And she said, I didn't tell him I was taking him out of this church. <laughs> so she brought him to our house church. He didn't know any different. He just thought, well, house church, okay, it's part of it. He, it was a few weeks later, he says, you're not part of that church. I said, no, uh, don't give us a tithe. Don't give it to them. No, we, 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 don't, we, don't, we don't tithe. We do tithe, but in a different way. We didn't ask for money back then. But anyways, uh, so here he is. And at the end of the service, in a service. At the end of talking to them about the word, he comes to me and he says, I have been to Buddhist temples. I have been to mosques. I have searched out different religions. I've been to all the different denominations. And he said this to me. He says, I don't need to know if you're telling me the truth because I feel it here. And what he referred to after was, I felt the love here. By this shall all men know you are my disciples, if what? You have love one for another. Same happened with another man came in, didn't know the Lord. Our brother Edgar was preaching. And he, was spe he was speaking to us. And afterwards, this man came to me, tears running down his face. He was afraid to go to talk to Edgar. Now, Edgar is a loving God. And I said, well, why are you afraid? He said he could feel the love of Christ and Edgar and the power of the Spirit. He says, I don't even want to talk to that man. He's too holy, he said. <laughs> and Edgar just said he didn't know me. But this happened two or three weeks. And, and finally the crying stopped after about a month and he gets saved. We never ask people to pray sinners. Do you know, show me in the Bible. I, I want to be gracious for a sinner's prayer. You know, sinners pray and sinners get saved. But, you know, until the 1950s, there was no such thing as a sinner's prayer. Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord. We just tell people, call in the name of the Lord in your time, in your way, whatever you, you know, just, just let the Lord save you. Man, when you let the Lord do it, it's amazing what He does. Like, people get saved and they're well saved. Right? And then we started seeing, this is funny, we started seeing God save Christians. Christians were getting born again. That's amazing. When they, you know what a revival is, mostly? It's when Christians get saved. That, that's what a revival is. Um, that's what got me um, moved on from one church once. At least. <laughs> um, 
Do you know one of the main barriers to revival is a joyless, loveless walk with God? Now someone might say, well, I thought that sin was the greatest barrier to revival. Isn't that what 2 Chronicles 7.14 it says? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sins and heal their land. Yes, sin is a barrier to revival. But I want to ask another question today. Why do we sin? Because if we answer that question, why do we sin, we'll know how to get revived. The reason that we sin, the reason there is so little revival in our lives, is because according to Psalm 85.6, we do not rejoice in the Lord, we do not love Him as we ought. It's not enough for us to be convicted about sin to experience revival. It's not enough for us even to be obedient to the Lord to experience revival. We saw that with the Pharisees. They didn't experience it. Revival will come personally and corporately when we come to that place in our lives when we love the Lord Jesus Christ with all of our hearts and we feel joy in a daily relationship with Him. Now before I go on and prove this from Scripture, we need to understand that the reason we sin, and by the way, sin is what prevents revival, is because we love something or someone else more than the Lord Jesus. That's why we don't have revival. And when we love something more than the Lord, what do we do? We sin. Jesus said, if you love me, Keep my commandments. He also said it another way. If you keep my commandments, you love me. So sometimes we, we don't balance the two verses. We say, well, I'm going to just, like a Pharisee, obey all these things. So I must love the Lord. No, no, no. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If we, folks, Jesus said, what's the greatest commandment? To love God with our hearts, our minds, and strength. Right? On that commandment hinge what? All of the law and the prophets. You see why the Puritans used to say, Love God and do what you want. You say, that's it's risky. How can I preach that? Think about it. Love God, they used to say, the Puritans, and do what you want. It's when we don't love God that we get into trouble and we break that first commandment. You remember that's what caused Adam and Eve to sin, was it not? They weren't content having the Lord Jesus Christ to walk with them in the cool of the day and to enjoy, have all their joy in Him and just to express their love and appreciation and adoration for the glorious things He had done in creation. Adam was a part of naming everything. He had first-hand experience. Can you imagine being so close? Without, without sin clouding his intellect. How brilliant that man and woman must have been. And they knew God. And they weren't content in that garden with not having noisy neighbors, with not fighting traffic jams, and not having to worry about the IRS and paying taxes. They weren't just happy with the Lord's presence and His blessing, and they were tricked into believing that they would be happier if they could just have that piece of fruit. Now things haven't changed over the years. The Israelites thought they'd be happy if, if only they could have meat. And they pray, or they, they, they didn't pray, they grumbled. You see, God also hears our grumblings. And He even answers grumblings. And it says, He sent in these low flying quail under the radar, and they grabbed them right out of the air. Sister's chicken right there, they just grabbed it. And they started eating it. And it says, while the meat was still between their teeth, he sent leanness to their souls. The very thing they thought they would love and would give them enjoyment sent leanness to their souls. David thought he could be happy if he had a Bathsheba. God sent leanness to his soul. We can all think that if I only had this and could get this, and we, we pursue this, that, or the other thing, 
But we'll be happy in God sends leanness to our souls because we have left the Lord Jesus Christ. And bear in mind, every single sin that we get into is a ploy of the devil to substitute a person or possessions or pursuits in place of Christ. Do you understand the way that works? We often think of sin in terms of temptation, and that's how it starts. But he appeals to our lusts. And he says, if you just, basically what he says, if you just had that, you'd be happy. In other words, that is more appealing, that thing is more lovable than Jesus. And they're distractions from keeping us from loving God with all our hearts. And by the way, many of the things we sin in are actually good things that God has made and given to us. It's just that we love them more than Him. 2 Timothy 3.1 says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You see? We sin when we love the sin more than the Lord Jesus. Matthew 6.24, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. In other words, you will love one over the other. You see, money is a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. And if you're afraid of losing your home and your investments and all these things, which, by the way, God is going to take that. You realize that uh, the world economy is just teetering on the edge. And so if our hearts are set on these things, we will love them and be more concerned about them than the Lord. And He wants to free us from that so that our hearts... He says, give me your hearts. He doesn't need our money. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. But when He has our heart, He has everything anyways. He has our bank account. First John 2.15 Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. James 4.4 4, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think the Scripture says without reason that the Spirit He caused to live in us envies intensely? In other words, God is jealous when we love something or someone else more than Him. So we can see why God can't send revival personally. And let's talk about personally. It's not about others. It's not about a mass revival across this country. I live in a high and holy place, but also with Him who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the heart of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. He's talking about one of us. Do we love something we own more than the Lord Jesus and do we prove that by how much time we spend caring for that thing or worrying about losing it? Whether it's money or investments or homes or cars or jewelry or electronics or clothing. Do we love pleasure more than God? And by pleasure, I mean things that can be anything. It's it's something that we devote time to, to the exclusion of God. Physical exercise. Scripture says bodily exercise profiteth little. I mean, I just look uh, you know, all around and you know, the nutrition stores and the advertisements and everything. I, I mean, people trying to stay fit, just, just eat a little bit and you stay fit. I mean, it's, it, I mean why? there's just a whole cult out there of this thing, uh, catering to the body, uh, fleshly lusts. TV, sports, hobbies, impurity, pornography, lustful thoughts. I, always, I hear these sermons about how terrible it is about pornography, abortion, all that. That's the fruit of the root. Don't, pastors, we've got to stop just talking and, and making people feel guilty about the fruit. The fruit comes from the root. And, and if you pull the fruit off, 
it, either it'll grow back or it grows back in another place. So we give up something, some lustful, uh, fleshly pleasure here, and another one pops up in its place that may even look different. Because the reason we sin is because we love the sin more than we love the Lord Jesus. You know, I used to weep over my sin years ago. I don't weep over my sin anymore. Do you know what I weep over? I weep because the Lord showed me, Mark, you love that sin more than me. Could we get honest with ourselves again and say, Lord, I love this person, or I love being selfish, I love pandering to me, I love the way I talk, I love the way I say things, I love all of these things that I am, I love goals and possessions, all these things. I love these things more than you. You see Psalm 51.6 before the psalmist was restored with joy and love for the Lord so that others could be revived. He said this, Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. I'll never forget sitting in my living room one day and I was praying, confessing my sins and the Lord stopped me and He said to me, Mark, why don't you tell me the truth about that sin? And so I sat there and I said, Okay, what's the truth? And it was quite free. It was convicting. It was freeing. You know what I said? Lord Jesus, I love this sin and I named it. I love it. And I love it more than you. I was devastated. That was the beginning when God began showing me. He said, you know what? Mark, until you get to the root of sin, which is loving it more than you love me, (laughs) I can't touch your heart and use you. God wants honesty. Proverbs 28, 13, He who conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. I had no intention of preaching this message. Absolutely none. No intention. And three weeks ago, the Lord came on me. I wept on and off for four and a half hours. I thought that was it. Then that Sunday morning before I preached, I was on my knees and I wept another half hour. And then yesterday in the parking lot, I wept for another half hour or so. And the Lord says, Mark, you're going to preach to sinners like you. You don't just need to nail down the fruit. They know. The Holy Spirit's in them. If they're saved, they know. But you tell them what I've now shown you. That when we sin, we sin because we love the sin more than the Lord Jesus. I love your word more than my daily bread. Lord, I love things. I love things that pander to my flesh more than I love the living word. Don't stop confessing the sin, the fruit of sin. Confess the root, which is, if you're like me, I love the sin more than the Savior sometimes. You see, our hearts can attach themselves to so many things other than God. As a matter of fact, we're, our hearts are so attached to people, places, and things that in the rapture, do you know a lot of Christians are going to go up feet first holding on to the things they love? A hundred years from now, friend, we, don't, we won't even care about the things that we're, we're worried about and we love today. Unless it's the Lord and His people. 1 John 2.17 The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Do you know there's not one reason why any one of us cannot have a personal revival today? There's not one reason. Will you not revive us? By the way, the us is lowercase. It's not capital U period, capital S period. It's not will you not revive the US of A. 
Will you not revive us? Us is me. Us is you. That your people may rejoice in you. And now, once we understand the root of our sin, which is loving sin and not Jesus, now doesn't it make sense when we quote Second Chronicles 7.14, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. What are the wicked ways? Digging cisterns that hold no water, loving something or someone else more than Jesus. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. Now, here is where that old devil comes in to mess things up for us. He'll come and tell you that you're so great a sinner, that you've sinned so greatly, that you could never expect to be forgiven. You've somehow squeezed out the last drop of God's grace and mercy. Has he ever told you that? Oh, God can forgive you for these other things, but not this one. Oh, and the devil knows the Bible so good, doesn't he? And he quotes Hebrews 12, 7. You might not remember the reference, but you remember this if you've been around for years. He'll tell you about Esau, you know, afterwards, as you know. When he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. And he could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessings with tears. And he'll tell you God can never use you again. He'll never forgive you for that. 1 Corinthians 11.31 says, If we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. Now, I have a problem with some revival preaching. And I say that because I used to do it. Boy, I could, I, I could really smoke people. Oh, you could smell the fire and brimstone when I preached. And when we preach like that, in a way, we misrepresent God because my Bible says in Psalm 103, verse 8, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will He harbor His anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, because if He did, not one of us would be here today. And we're here today as living proof that He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His love for those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as He removed their transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. For He knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. There is grace and mercy for you today if you will come and confess the root of your sin and my sin. You know, I remember years ago, sometimes reading books isn't the best thing. God put me on quarantine once. I don't advocate this, but it took me 14 years. I never read a book. He said, stop reading. I'm going to teach you through the Word. But I remember reading something where General Booth talked. He, he, he said, Lord, I wish that all my elders could be dangled over hell for one minute and they, they would cure them of their ba backsliding. That's a paraphrase, but that's what he did. So I thought, I don't know if I want to be dangled over hell, but I would like to have an Isaiah experience and see the glory of God. Lord, just show me your glory and I won't backslide. I don't need to see hell. I know about hell. I, I just want to see your glory. Well, I was minding my own business and one day I was alone in my apartment on my knees praying and all of a sudden this terrible picture I saw in my mind's eye. I used to have a country place. We had a country place, family country place in Vermont on Lake Champlain. And one day I had the, the, the onerous task of digging up that cesspool. And then as I was praying, I saw myself in the center of that cesspool with my nose just above the sludge line. And I said, Lord, what is this? And the Lord spoke to me very clearly in my heart. And he said, that's the way I see your sin, Mark. And I said, surely not I. I said that. I said, 
That's the sin of the prostitutes and drug dealers in Parkside, at King and Jameson in Toronto, where the red light district is. I used to take teams up there to witness. I said, that's their sin, that's not my sin. And I'm going to quote exactly what I heard in my heart. And the Lord said to me, Mark, that is the way I see your sin. Because when they sin, they do what comes naturally. But when you sin, you sin against knowledge and light. Now, that means that those of us who are preachers, not many of you should presume to be preachers or teachers knowing that those of us who teach will incur the stricter judgment. My brother Edgar taught me this when he came to preach. He says, Mark, I consider everyone better than myself because God revealed my sin to me. I never forgot, thank you, brother, because the Lord used that to teach me. The Lord began showing my sin. And there's not a person that I've met since then that I don't say, brother or sister, in my heart, you're better than me. You're better than me. Not one. Anyways, I, after God showed me the sin, it felt... You know, the, whole, the psalmist said, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. I know that doesn't happen theologically, but I know what it's like to feel that. Maybe you felt that. The Holy Spirit felt that He was taken from me. I felt that at any moment I could slide in hell. I used to remember reading that in Jonathan Edwards. People hold on to the pillars feeling they were sliding into hell itself. I wept every day for two weeks out of fear and anguish, feeling that God had left me, and at any second I could plunge into hell for eternity. My sin, I, had si- I never saw it as I saw it for two weeks. And I remember I was driving on the 401, one of our major highways back from seminary, and I was driving this old Honda Civic and it, the front end had broken and I used to be a mechanic and we used to fix cars and customize them. So I'd taken a big old drive shaft, propped it under the front so that the front end could kind of slide on this bar. It was very dangerous, by the way. But I took calculated risks. I kind of understood front ends. And um, uh, I was praying. as I, I, would hear, I don't know how I didn't have an accident. I would drive and then the Holy Spirit would convict me and I would just be weeping. I could hardly see. I didn't need windshields out there. I needed them on my eyes. I, I couldn't see where I was going. I said, oh Lord, just take my life. I can't live like this anymore. Seeing my sin, cause this car to go into the guardrail. It, it, it'll be an understandable accident because of that front end and kill me. Take my life. And I got home that day Again alone in the apartment, and I got down on my knees in frustration, and I was crying, and I said, God, you've always answered my prayers, but you didn't answer the prayer. I prayed that you would give me a vision of your holiness, and you didn't answer that prayer. And God, again, after two weeks of silence, he said this to me. He says, Mark, I did answer your prayer, but I couldn't show you my holiness until I first showed you your sinfulness. This doesn't happen very often, but the Holy Spirit... Laid on my heart, you turn to Micah chapter 7. I didn't even know it was there. I opened my Bible to Micah chapter 7, verse 18, and I read these words, Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but the light to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. And the Lord says, Mark, I love you. I've forgiven you. And it broke. And His love came over my heart. And the Lord said to me this, the last thing I heard in this uh, this encounter, was He said this, Now Mark, I want to tell you, don't you dare ever look down on anyone in their sin again. Never. Oh, I love the book of Joel, chapter 2. I named my eldest son Joel. Joel chapter 2, verse 12, God says, Even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. Why? Because our hearts have attached themselves to things, good things even, that become bad things because they turn us from God. Return with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and He relents. Folks, He relents from sending calamity. Why? He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. Who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord our God. You say, Mark, are you saying that God will not judge or punish us for our sins? No, that's not what I am saying. I am saying 
that he does not, if we will come to him, if we judge ourselves, we will not come under judgment, that God is giving us an opportunity today. God calls it again today, according to Hebrews 3 and 4. God has called another day today. Today is today, May 8th. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your, your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Isaiah 57, 15, this is what the high and lofty one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. I want to say this, sometimes we try to pray down revivals. And I know prayer is very important. But the issue is not whether we can get God to come to us, it's whether we go to God. Azariah the prophet in 2 Chronicles 15 that Edgar read at the beginning said, The Lord is with you when you are with Him. The question is not whether we can pray Him down today, brothers and sisters. The Lord is. It's a promise. One of the 7,487 promises in Scripture. He says the Lord is with you when you are with Him. And we are with Him when our hearts are with Him. All of our hearts Set your minds on things above. Set your hearts, your affections on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. I'll never forget the day God says, Now Mark, I want your heart. He showed me something. He says, Mark, you've surrendered everything in your life. You surrendered your house and you surrendered your money and you surrendered your cars and your businesses because I'm a tent maker and you surrendered all these things. You've surrendered all this to me. And by the way, I don't need it. There's one thing you haven't surrendered to me, and that is your will. <sighs> he said, my son, give me your heart. Because when I have your heart, I have everything else anyways. I wept. Not because of my sin, but because of my sin of not giving him my heart and loving other things more than him. You know, I'm tempted to pray, uh, preach a message called When God Stopped the Prayer Meeting. You know God stopped the prayer meeting in the Old Testament? The book of Joshua 7. Joshua and the leaders are on their faces and they're crying out to God. And what does God say? Stand up! Israel has sinned. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever is among you. That dot dot dot. Brothers and sisters, I love you. <laughs> and I'm a sinful man, but I know the Lord Jesus loves you more. And He shows me, stop crying about your sin in terms of the action and cry and weep about the sin of loving it more than God. Oh, the sin needs to be repented. Don't get me wrong. Oh, but are we willing to love the Lord Jesus Christ more than that thing? And see, I, when I sit in revival meetings, I remember there was one preacher, Louis Cetera. He's a great preacher. And he was master having lists. He had lists, I'm sure. I used to swear that he'd, he'd uh, interview my wife-to-be because he would just go through all these lists. And man, he just, uh, it was like the beginning hit with buckshot. Sometimes, though, I could dodge them all. You know, the preacher didn't mention my sin. Now, I know I've missed some of your sins, but the Holy Spirit hasn't because He told you about it in that still, quiet voice that we heard about today. But if you come to Him, He is gracious and compassionate. He's brought us here today so that we could find Him in revival personally. Will you not revive us, me again, so that I might rejoice in you? Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Let me, let me just close in prayer and we'll let the Lord speak to us. <sighs> Heavenly Father, we come to You in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, You've done so many wonderful things. Oh, <laughs> You've saved us from eternal hell. You do not give us what we deserve. We think we deserve so much. We don't deserve anything but roasting in hell next to that devil. But you have not treated us as our sins deserve. 
Oh, you have mercy and compassion. You want to move our sins so far from us. And all you ask us to do is to have truth in the inner parts, to judge ourselves so that we don't come under judgment, to come to you and tell you what you already know, that, Lord, when we sin, we love sin more than we love you. That ought to break our hearts. Oh, God, have mercy. You're so loving. We're sinning against love. We're not sitting against the mean God. He's not like a father or a mother that we grew up with or an educator or a pastor or anyone else. You're a loving father. You love us. And like the prodigal son, we run. We squander all your blessings on what we think will make us happy. And one day, when we have to reach up to touch bottom, we remember what we had. We remember our first love. We know we're not worthy to be called your sons anymore, or daughters. We come back to you today. Just make us one of your servants. We want to be a servant of God. We don't care about a title. We want to be called a servant of God. We can only be servants when we come to you. And before we can even say too much, you cut us off. You don't even listen to our confession because you know about it. Before we even say it, and you tell us, you hug us. You embrace us. You give us a robe of righteousness because we finally confess the sin that drove us from you is love for the world. You give us a robe of righteousness. You put a ring on us and you restore us. And there's more joy in heaven over one Christian even who repents than 99 righteous who do not need to repent. God, have mercy. Help us to see your love. Shed your love abroad in our heart. Not so that we can just steal your love or love others, but so that we can love the Lord Jesus Christ. The role of the Holy Spirit is to exalt Christ and to help us to love Him. We can't love Him. We can't love you without your help. God, have mercy on us. Descend upon us, O Lord, with your love. We're not even going to ask you to come. We don't need to. You dwell in a high and holy place, and you'll come to one of us today, or two of us, or the whole group of us, if we just come with a contrite and lowly heart and tell you what you already know we've done. And we can be revived today. Then we'll teach transgressors your way and sinners will turn back to you. We thank you, O God. We praise you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are so wonderful. We love you. We love you. Help us to love you. Help us, O Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you, uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter 11. May the Lord, in His kindness, according to the intention of His will for leaving this Word with us, may He grant us a spirit of wisdom and understanding in the knowledge of Him. May this Word have its purpose in our hearts. May it cast down imaginations and, and uh, every high and lofty thought that is simply there to set themselves up against the true knowledge of the living God. In Hebrews chapter 11, read with me in verse 5 about our uh, one of our forefathers, Enoch. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and he was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken away, he had obtained this witness. What witness had he obtained? Yeah. That he walked with God is in the in the Hebrew Hebrew scriptures in the in the Septuagint that he pleased God. That's what it says in the Septuagint. That was a that was a summary of his life. He pleased God and God took him. That's what we need to be known for. 
Look in, uh, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul said this is what he made his entire ambition. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Same word here where it says each of us should uh, to uh, desire or make it our goal to live a quiet and uh, peaceable life. It's Here it's actually the Greek word is to love the honor. Paul says here in verse 9, Therefore we, we choose to love the honor, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what He has done, whether good or bad. And regardless of what you and I do, it's not so much important what it looks like. The result had better be that it was pleasing Amen. to God. That, that's what we make our goal. Not the specifics of what each of us are called to do. Not everyone's called to preach or be a missionary. I don't care if you make log, split logs or sell donuts or make ice cream cones. You do it to please God. That's why you do it. That's the goal of it. In, the, in, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul talks about uh, in his letter to the church of Ephesians, how important this is. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things that he just he previously mentioned, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Have no fellowship with them. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light, or the fruit of the Spirit, is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and proving, proving what is pleasing to the Lord. The Greek word comes from the idea of you prove by testing. Don't just, in your own mind, well, it might, seems good to me. The things that you do, you had better prove by testing whether it's pleasing to the Lord. There is a way that seems right to a man. Every man does what's right in his own eyes, but if it is not pleasing to the Lord, and you've not made the effort to prove that it is, you're going to find yourself in an awkward position if he's not pleased with you. Okay? In Colossians chapter 1. Two books from Ephesians, Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. Paul's prayer for the saints there at Colossae is recorded in the first part of his letter to them. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, that's talking about of their faith, do not cease to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord. Some of the verses say, pleasing Him in every way. Fully pleasing Him. Or pleasing Him in all things. Being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. This whole message this morning on my heart is a, a, a time for us to examine is that our modus operandi? Is it the reason we do everything to be pleasing to Him? The only safe way to live. And you're going to find in Scripture, it's not just, it's not just a, a nice option if you want to be extra spiritual. It's a matter of life and death. You know, it, you want to hear God say to you, well done and well come? He must view how you've lived well if He's going to welcome you. And He must view how you've lived as you have done well in order for Him to say, well done, because He's not going to lie. To some people, He's going to say, depart from me, ye evildoers. They weren't well doers. They did evil. So it's not just, it's not just a, for those who want to be extra spiritual. Those who please God will go to heaven. Why should God keep people around that He took no pleasure in? You and I don't. 
When, we, when, when something no longer gives us pleasure, we either sell it in a garage sale or throw it away. No. God has created hell for that purpose. All right, a question. Where can you and I look for an example, a model of someone who we know from the Scripture was fully pleasing to the Father? Enoch. Enoch? Okay, well, he walked with God. All right, that was easy. Is there another one that we might have a little more detail about? Jesus. How do we know that He was well-pleasing to the Father? At His baptism. At His baptism, a voice from heaven was heard, This is My beloved Son, and with whom I am well-pleased. Okay. Well, do you realize that this was said of Him before He even began His ministry? He hadn't even begun to minister yet. So what had He done that had been so well-pleasing? Okay, let's look in the Scripture. All right, turn with me to Luke chapter 2. It says that everyone who claims to live in Him ought himself to walk even as He walked. So why don't we just take His walk even before His ministry and measure our walk by it? Okay? And to see if, if, if we are well-pleasing. Luke chapter 2, verses 39 and 40. Let's begin there. So when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city of Nazareth. And now speaking of Jesus, and the child grew and became strong in spirit. First thing I'll look at. You know, God is pleased when we grow. Yeah, for sure. Grow. Are you growing? Are you growing and becoming strong in spirit? Even in your old age, are you finished growing? Are you, is your love growing cold? Or is your love growing stronger? Is your walk becoming weak? Or is your walk becoming stronger? God is pleased when we grow and become stronger. Look what it says in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, and, and for the sake of brevity, if I don't give you a lot of time to turn there, have patience with me. I will tell you where the reference is. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 state this. You don't need to have any extra Bible drill training when you attend this church. You just keep up. Just, that's the, you just learn. Therefore, laying aside all malice and all deceit and hypo hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes crave the pure spiritual milk of the Word, so that you may what? Grow thereby. Okay? Alright, we need to grow thereby. Ephesians chapter 4. You know, babies are cute while well, they're babies. But you know something that says clearly in the Word? God doesn't want us to stay babies. God doesn't want it. He, he, he is pleased when we grow out of infancy. Ephesians chapter 4, read with me verse 14. He, and I'll just set the stage. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, that, for, that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a complete or a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ in order that we no longer be infants. Well, I just say this. If you stand before God as spiritual infant, when you've had time to grow, you'll go to hell. You will, you will have failed your goal in pleasing Him. You stand before Him an infant and you'll die an infant separate from Him forever. He's not pleased when people stay spiritual infants. It's not His will. We are to crave pure spiritual milk so that we can grow. And we are to grow up all... He does not want us to stay infants. How do we know that? What's another place we're told that? Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It is possible to be a believer and be an infant in Christ. To be born again and be an infant in Christ. But what is an infant in Christ called? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. 
What does Paul call an infant in Christ? Carnal. Does God want to take a carnal people to heaven? No. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Who is going to go to heaven? God is going to take a spiritual people. We've come to the new Jerusalem, Amen. to the city of the living God, to thousands upon thousands of angels and joyful city, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. And if you show up there as a spiritual infant because of your own neglect, prepare to hear Him say, Depart from Me. You didn't grow. You didn't become stronger. God is pleased when we go stronger. Uh, and we know it's supposed to happen by personal responsibility. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. The writer of Hebrews explaining the difficulty that teachers have when they're trying to speak to someone who by their own choices are not able to hear and grow properly. Hebrews chapter 5, beginning with verse 11. Of whom we have much to say, speaking about Jesus' role as the high priest, of whom we have much to say, but it's hard to explain since ye have become dull of hearing. You don't hear well. For though by this time you ought to be teachers. Do you see that? There's a time period where someone should go from being a spiritual infant to someone able to teach others about the way of righteousness. Clearly. And if you are an infant by, neg by your choice, by neglecting your salvation, prepare to find out when you stand before God He was not pleased with your progress. By this time you ought to be teachers. But you need someone to teach you again what are the very rudimentary principles of the oracles of God. And instead of coming to need solid food, you come to need milk. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in what? The word of righteousness. That which is very pleasing to God. He's just a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, full stature, fully mature. That is, how did they get there? How did they get there according to the last part of verse 14? Because, who by reason, here's the reason they are of full age spiritually. They have exercised their senses. You know what the word here is? They've gumnazoed them. That we get our word gem. They've been to the spiritual gym and they have been working out spiritually. They have disciplined themselves. They have gymnized themselves to be strong spiritually. And if you are a spiritually pitiful infant because you refuse to go and practice some self-discipline, prepare to stand before God and hear Him call you to account for being an expert in a lot of things while an infant spiritually. It does not please God for people to stay spiritual infants. And it's not just a matter, it's really not just a matter of, well, that would be neat, we can be kind of extra spiritual and you could be one who leads in church. Do you realize what it says of those in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 when Paul says, those who came out of Egypt, here when he's describing all who came out of Egypt and all who passed through the sea and all who drank from the from the rock and all who ate the spiritual manna and they were baptized into Moses and in the cloud and in the sea and they drank from the spiritual rock that was among them and that rock was Christ. This whole description of them, it says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, verse 10, actually 1 Corinthians 10, what it actually says was, nevertheless God was not pleased with most of them. It, in the Greek, it's, it's most of them. And what happened to the ones he, were not, he was not pleased with? They died where? Outside of the promise. You see, where I get it from the Scripture, that if you die without having obtained the witness that you were pleasing to God, you will die outside of the promise. You will not enter the kingdom He has prepared for you. So Paul says, 
He has an example. He has a, he has a means to take care of this. The, chapter 9, verse 24. Okay? Chapter 9, verse 24 is the solution to this. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Now here's what he says. Everyone who competes for the prize is what? He is temperate or he is self-controlled, or he is disciplined in all things. Let me ask you that. Is your spiritual life that way? Everything you do, you, you, you check it out whether it's healthy for you spiritually. Or do you categorize, well, that's my spiritual life, that's Sunday, and that's Wednesday, or this is my little morning devotion. Hey, but the rest of this time, this TV show, this movie, this radio, this magazine, this activity, hey, that's okay, because I fulfilled my little spiritual requirements. Or is it everything measured by, is this going to cause me to grow? Is this going to cause me to be strengthened? Is this well-pleasing unto God? If you don't live that way, don't expect to go to heaven. Because it's only those who live that way are well-pleasing to God. Heaven is not a big, wide-open gate for the masses. It's a narrow way and a very small gate, and only a very few find it. So Jesus uses this word in describing it, agonize to enter. I encourage you to do so. Let's look back in uh, in uh, <coughs> Jesus' life back in Luke chapter 2. Keep your finger there. I'll go back there a couple more times. Luke chapter 2, verses uh, 46 and 49. See how Jesus Himself did this? Interesting story here. At when, what, where did his parents find him when they looked for him for three days? They found him in the temple. What was he doing? Verse 46. So it was that after three days, they found him in the temple. Where? Sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished and, and, and at his understanding and answers. Now, where are you going to find someone interested in righteousness? You're going to find them sitting in the midst of those who have it. Are you sitting in the midst of the teachers? Or are you waiting for the teachers to chase you down like some unfaithful little puppy who doesn't know where to come to when the, when the plate's set out there all the time? We have Bible study here all the time. We gather for prayer all the time. Saints gather for all the time. And if you want it, you come for it. And if you're, if you're not interested, you're only showing the world and others that it's not that big a deal to you. You can go where you want to go. You'll hear what you want to do. And what is a favorite thing of you? You pursue it all the time. Jesus showed what He was interested in knowing by where He was sitting in the midst of. He who walks with the wise becomes wise. But a companion of fools comes to ruin. Because he's not interested in wisdom. And if you want wisdom, it's there. And you'll show you want it by sitting in the midst of those who have it by the grace of God. And if you're not interested, you'll show it by your actions. Because you'll always do the things you want to do. You'll always make time for the things you want time for. Wherever a man's treasure is, that's where his heart will be. Jesus made this very clear in Mark chapter 4. If you want to see this real quick in Mark 4, verses 21 through 24 says this. Mark 4, 21 through 24. And he said to them, Is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Any of you ever lit a candle? How many of you have ever lit a candle to some, to, you know, ask someone to go, you know, the lights have gone out, and thanks to our faithful electric companies, and you go and you light a candle, 
And the first thing you do after you light your candle is grab a bowl from the cupboard and stick it on top. None of you do that. That's what he's asking. For there's nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. So why is everyone else getting this message in parables then and the disciples get it plainly? Well, that's answered in verse 39. Verse 33, excuse me. Verse 33. And with many such parables He spoke the word to them as much as they were able to hear. But without a parable He did not speak to them. And when they were with, alone, He explained all things to who? <laughs> Everyone who's His disciple understands it all. Every, you know what disciple means? Learner. Everyone, yeah, a disciplined one. A disciple, a one who is disciplining himself to learn Christ gets it all explained to him. You ever wondered why someone has so much spiritual understanding and they're the same year, number of years you have in the Lord? Is it possible that they're the ones who go and spend time alone with Christ so He can explain to them everything you heard when you were together? There, it says, be very careful how you hear. To him who has, much shall be given, and he shall have an abundance. But him who has not, even what he thinks he has will be taken from him. And that's happening in the world today. There are those who know less of the Lord today than they did when they first started. Because they're living by what they think they know. And they're not in the midst of the teachers. They don't come to Bible study. They don't assemble with the saints because they think they know enough already. Woe to them. Woe to them. They'll find out if by deliberate choices they have failed to be pleasing to God. They'll be suddenly surprised that they gave their life to the meaningless and threw away the pearl of great price. What a shame. And this is a message to just make a clear warning against that. How in the world will I finish this in, in uh, time allotted? I'll try. Back to Luke chapter 2 again. <clears throat> Verse 40. Not only did he grow and was, and was becoming strong in spirit, what else in the latter part of verse 40 does it say he was? He was being filled with wisdom. I'm just going to mention one verse from this passage just for, for brevity's sake. One verse. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. It's a command. Foolishness is a choice. It's a choice to be ignorant by not pursuing to know. Wisdom cries out to the fools every single day. All you who are simple, leave your simple ways and you will live. That's what wisdom cries out every day. You must leave simplicity to pursue knowing. And we had better not be foolish. We had better understand what the will of the Lord is. Because God, God says, this is good and acceptable before God who wants all men to be saved. Amen? amen. We always say amen to there. What's the rest of that Scripture? Someone quote me the rest of that Scripture. This is good and acceptable before God who wants all men to be saved. And come to the full knowledge of the truth. It's just as important. God wants to be known. He wants to be understood. He has made, He has hidden certain things. He's made them a mystery. You know why? It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. And it's the glory of kings to search it out. He didn't design... Where are you going to find treasure on this earth? When's the last time you found a diamond just walking out there on the road? When's the last time you came across valuable gold just walking along? You dig. You dig. You search. And you go where you know there's report that it is. It's amazing. When they heard report that there was gold found out in California, thousands of idiots ran out there. 
Excuse me. Sorry. Some of them actually found it. They weren't, I guess they weren't idiots. They were the successful ones. But I mean, they sold everything for something that perishes. For perishes. It doesn't even last. And, the, and God is giving His knowledge to men. And there are certain men who have it. And, there's, and He's making it known to anyone who wants it. But if you are foolish enough to not avail yourself to it, you will show your own folly. And it's going to be fully exposed in the day you stand before Him and give an account for your, how little you cared about what was well-pleasing to Him. Be careful. Luke Verse 40, last thing that I want to mention about this verse 40 is not only was he filled with wisdom, but the grace of God was upon him. How important is this? Well, this, this grace is not talking about unmerited favor. Not here. Every, every favor Jesus had was merited by his walk. This is the same kind of grace that was upon him like it was on Noah. Well, all the whole world was filled with wicked, and every, every thought of men was, was only evil continually from their youth. Noah found grace in the eyes of God. And this was a testimony of Noah. He was blameless and righteous among the generation of his time. That's why he found grace with God. And that kind of grace had better be upon us. You know what the Scripture says? It says, The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. And what does that grace do? It child trains us. It takes us from infancy. Pi do on top. It takes us from infancy and literally trains us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. That grace had better be upon us. You had better be being trained by God to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow. That grace had better be upon you. And you know what he says about that grace in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8? He is able to make all of this grace abound to you. He's able to make it abound to you so that having all sufficiency for all time, you may always have more than you need for every good work. Is this grace upon you? When the grace of God is upon you, you're well-pleasing to God. And it says, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace reign in life. That's Romans chapter 5, verse uh, 17. If, if you want to be well-pleasing to God, you had better be growing. You had better be becoming strong in spirit. You had better not still be an infant. You had better be being filled with wisdom because you are pursuing it with all your heart. You had better be, you had better have the grace of God upon you and you be learning to deny the things that are ungodly. And you had better be learning, being trained to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. That's pleasing to God when this is happening. And lastly, uh, verse uh, 51 and 52 of chapter 2 of Luke says this. And he went down with his parents and came to Nazareth, was submitting to them. And his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus was advancing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. I like this word advancing. I just want to so focus on this one word. It's pro ekapte. Pro is towards and kapto, kapto is cut. Brother, sister, he was cutting a straight path. You know what it says in Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 11.5, it says, the, the righteousness of a blameless man makes a straight way for him. But the wicked are brought down by their unfaithfulness. When, when righteousness, when you are seeking first the kingdom of God, and His righteousness. You know what it's going to make for you? A straight path. You, have, you are going to be cutting right through the thick and lies and deceptions and all the gray and all the, all the is this okay things. You know, see the difference is if your eye be 
single, your whole body is full of light. When someone's single focus is to be pleasing to God in all things, they are concerned about everything they do and they want to test it to make sure God is happy. But what if? What if that's not your main motivation? What if you're satisfied with just a little bit of heaven and a little bit of Jesus, but you want to make sure that you enjoy your your trip? What if it's what if pleasing yourself is part of the double focus? You know, cross eye, where you see double. What happened? You know, can you really live to please yourself and to please God at the same time? Impossible with man, but there is a way. There is with man it's impossible, but there is. You can do all things. You can find your greatest pleasure in pleasing him. And when your greatest pleasure is bringing pleasure to Him, then it says of Christ, For it is lo, it is written of me in the volume of the book, I delight to do Thy will. When you delight in doing the will of God, you've got it made. He who does the will of God shall live forever. You've made it. When you live that way. Wow. One last exhortation and we're done. Actually, it's an, it's a, it's a, but this exhortation it has a positive and a negative side. Okay? Positive and negative. Here's the positive. Okay? Most good batteries have a positive and negative side. Okay? Hebrews chapter 13. Positive side of this admonition. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. This is my prayer for us. I so agree with the writer of Hebrews as he was expressing his desire before God and to those he was writing. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect, complete in every good work to do His will, working in you what is well pleasing in His sight. Wow. May He do that. That's the positive side. May God so work in us everything that He is well pleased with. Here's the negative side of that admonition. Romans chapter 1. It's amazing we touched upon this in Sunday school. Romans chapter 1. Speaking of a people who know certain things are right and wrong, I can say very comfortably every single one of us here very comfortably fit in this verse as at least at the minimum of those who know God's righteous judgment. Because He says everyone knows it. The heavens declare it. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. All men are without excuse. Everyone knows God's righteous judgment. They all know it. It says in verse 32, Who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things deserve death, not only they do the same, but what's the scary part of the last part? It it says in in the New King James, they also approve of those who practice them. The literal Greek word is, they think well with. Eudikeo is the same word for pleasure. When you think well of something, it pleases you. A simple admonition, no, not a simple, a life or death admonition to every person here. If you take pleasure in something God hates, you're going to hell. Plain and simple. Justify yourself, call me a legalist, you'll burn in hell while I spend time with the Father forever if I am found pleasing in His sight. The argument is not with me. You had better test all things and find them pleasing to Him. Because it says, the last verse comes to my mind, 2 Thessalonians, so that all will be damned 
who have received not the love of the truth, but taken pleasure in unrighteousness. Thought well of unrighteousness. May God have mercy on us. Let's pray. Father, according to Your tender mercy, may You cause the fear of the Lord to fall upon Your people. May You pull down the arrogant pride that You dress Yourself in battle garments to resist. And may every person here who humbles themselves and trembles at Your Word find You faithful to pour out grace upon May Your Word be fulfilled. To the blameless, You show Yourself blameless. To the pure, You show Yourself pure. But to the crooked, You show Yourself perverse. May everyone who wants to know You with a pure heart see You clearly. May everyone hungering and thirsting for righteousness be filled. And may, according to Your great mercy, May sinners be turned from the error of their way that they could be saved from death. May, they, may You grant them repentance back to a life totally given over to pursue and do what brings You pleasure. We acknowledge we breathe Your air. We enjoy the laws of Your creation. We partake of the food You've provided. In You, we live and move and have our being. And some here, Father, are using the very being and life You're giving them to, on their own wicked and evil lust. Deliver them, Father. Deliver them. Have mercy. May the fear and the terror of God, Your hatred for sin, but Your willingness to be merciful to all who forsake it, be upon us all. In the name of our Lord Jesus, according to Your will, we ask. Amen. Sober word. Excuse me for being a little long. Brandy's going to come forward and just take our prayer request. And I don't believe we have a room any announcements. Yeah. Now may I encourage you to turn with me in your own copy of the Word of God again to Matthew and chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And I read verses 13 and 14. Our Lord Jesus speaking said, Enter in by the narrow gate, for... Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many are they that enter in thereby. For or because narrow is the gate, and straightened or compressed, restrained is the way that leads unto life, and few are they that find it. Now I'm assuming that we have at least a handful, if not more, who were not with us in the previous hour. Uh, may I just see how many are here that weren't in our Sunday school hour? Good, all right. Now, I'm going to attempt the impossible. I'm going to try to condense 50 minutes of exposition into 5 minutes of review. So I'm going to make the effort, tighten the seat belt of your own mind, and follow with me. I began by trying to show the setting of these verses. They don't just plop down out of nowhere, but they come in a particular setting. They come toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, that many have called a manifesto of the kingdom of God. A manifesto is an official declaration of the leading principles of a movement, of a concern. 
And Jesus has been preaching the gospel of the kingdom all throughout Galilee. And now here in chapter 5, we read that multitudes are gathered to him along with his disciples. And he sat down and he began to teach them. And what he does is basically to set forth this manifesto of the kingdom in three large groups of teaching. First of all, he describes the character traits of all the subjects of the kingdom of grace and the impact they will have upon the world around them. Those blesseds are basically a description, a portrait of what a son or daughter of the kingdom looks like and then the impact that they have upon the world, verses 13 to 16. Then in verse 17 of chapter 5, all the way through to chapter 7 and verse 12, he sets forth the righteousness of that kingdom, the righteousness that he himself fulfills, the righteousness that he provides, and the righteousness he demands of all the subjects of his kingdom. Then, beginning in verse 12, our Lord is passionately concerned that the multitudes gathered around him not only have their heads filled with this information about the kingdom, but he wants them to actually enter the kingdom. And so he speaks in the imperative, not merely inviting his listeners, but commanding them to enter the kingdom And he follows that gracious command with an extended sober warning. Beware of any bogus experience concerning entering the kingdom. Beware of false prophets who promise a way into the kingdom other than the narrow gate and the narrow way. Beware of those who merely talk and who do not embody the truth. Beware that you merely listen to my words. He says the foolish man is the one who hears his words, but does not do them. Then as we turn to the text itself, I ask you to note three things with me. The inseparable relationship between the gate, the way, and life. These three things are inseparable. And if you would go to heaven Christ's way, you must get through the narrow gate and you must be found walking upon the restricted, the constricted, the compressed way. They are inseparable. You've got all kinds of people that think they've come through the gate, but they're not on the narrow way, and yet they think they're going to heaven. Impossible. You've got others that try to live like a Christian who haven't come through the narrow gate. That's impossible. The gate and the way and life are inseparable realities. And then secondly, we must always remember the relative number of those who discover the narrow gate, walk on the narrow way, and enter into life with those who take an alternate way, the wide gate, the broad road that leads to destruction. Few find the narrow gate in the narrow road. Many enter in at the wide gate and the broad road. And then at the end, I ask you to notice of those three observations that there is always this dangerous but popular alternative to the narrow gate and to the compressed and restricted way. Jesus no sooner says, enter in by the narrow gate, but he gives a warning. There is a popular alternative, a wide gate and a broad way, but they lead to destruction. Then we parked for a while at that gate. What is it? It's a picture of biblical conversion, a sound, deep work of the Holy Spirit by which we are brought out of darkness into light, out of the kingdom of the devil into the kingdom of God. And I suggested, taking most of the material right from the Sermon on the Mount, that five things need to be unpacked at that gate. There are five things that must be repudiated if we are truly to enter the kingdom. 
we must repudiate all of our man-made notions about truth and reality. At that gate, Jesus stands saying, I am the king in my kingdom, enter here, and what I say must regulate all of your thinking about all of life and all of conduct. Secondly, we must repudiate our own righteousness. The Christ who stands there is the one who will eventually die, that he might satisfy the law of God in his death, and that he might provide a righteousness for us. And so the very first beatitude is, Blessed are the poor in spirit. They have nothing, can do nothing to earn their acceptance with God. They look out of themselves to another for their acceptance. And thirdly, there must be the repudiation of self as the governing principle of life. We come up to the gate, we've been living unto self. If we get through the gate, we no longer live unto ourselves, but unto him who for our sakes died and rose again. Fourthly, we must repudiate sin as the willful practice of life. Christ's kingdom is a righteous kingdom, and he expects righteousness in the lives of the subjects of his kingdom. And fifthly, we must repudiate the world as our chosen companion in life. If we become part of Christ's kingdom, we are now salt of the earth, light of the world. Our lives are governed by a totally different set of standards as the children of the living God. Now, that's the narrow gate. What then is this narrow or compressed way? Look again at the text. Enter in by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many are they that enter in thereby. Let's try to grapple with the identity of the narrow way. The word way is a standard word in the New Testament for a road or a path, something you travel on. That's it. Very simple. You don't need to know any uh, subtle nuances of the Greek language. He uses a very common word about this way, but then he uses a not so common word when he says, narrow is the gate and straightened or compressed or pressured or restricted is the way. This is the word translated elsewhere in the New Testament by the word afflict. Did. 2 Thessalonians 1 in verse 6, Hebrews 11 in verse 27, affliction is external pressure that comes upon us. Then there's one use that is very helpful. In Mark 3.9, it speaks of Jesus entering into a boat because the crowds were, here's our word, thronging him. They were pressing in upon him, and the Lord could hardly breathe, let alone have a good setting in which to preach and teach. So he asked them to put him in a little boat and go out into the lake, and from the lake, getting a little space between him and the people, he was able to teach and to preach. So the whole concept of this word is something that is pressured, hemmed in, restricted. So our Lord says that the way that leads unto life is not a big, broad, six-lane highway straight as an arrow. It is a narrow. It is a restricted. It is a constricted. It is a pressured and difficult way that leads unto life. And if you get nothing else this morning, I hope you do get something else, I hope you get this. What I want to establish from the scriptures is that this narrow, restricted, pressured way is nothing more, nothing less than every issue faced at the gate extending into life itself. Whatever the issues were that are settled at the gate they become part of a lifestyle that is the narrow, compressed, 
restricted way. In other words, the way this narrow, restricted, compressed, and pressured way is not something essentially and fundamentally different from the things we confront at the gate of a true conversion. No, it is simply the principles embedded in the heart of a sinner born of the Spirit of God who enters the gate, and what does he find? He finds a path open to him in which there must be a working out day by day, week by week, month by month, until he enters the presence of Christ, a working out of all the issues confronted at the gate. That's why nobody can walk in this way unless they've dealt with the issues at the gate. And the only proof that you've gotten through the gate is that you're walking in the way that is determined by the issues that are settled at the gate. You follow me? So the gate and way are united. That's why Jesus uses the singular when he says, And few there be, not that find them, the gate and the way, few there be that find it. Because there is an organic relationship between the gate and the way. Now, if that's so, let's go back then. What were the issues we said had to be confronted at the gate. What were the things that had to be unpacked at the gate? Well, the first was repudiating man-made thoughts about truth and reality, recognizing that left to ourselves we are blind, our minds are clouded, that we do not see reality for what reality is, and at that gate we're prepared to say, Lord Jesus, I embrace you as my prophet to teach me. Teach me who and what I am as a man. Teach me who and what I am as a woman. Teach me who and what I am as a father. Teach me who and what I am as a mother. Teach me who and what I ought to be as a son, as a daughter, as a citizen, as a workman. In every area of life, prepared to think God's thoughts after Him. Well, if that's what's involved in true conversion, the first part of this narrow way is this. It is a way of resolute determination to work out into every area of my life an application of the words of God, the Word of Christ, so that my passion is that every facet of my life will be shaped by the Word of God. Because though we repudiate all man-made thoughts about truth and reality at the gate, we carry a lot of internal baggage with us where we still think like worldlings and we still respond like worldlings. This is why the Apostle Paul used this language in Ephesians 4 and verse 23. This is a very key text as we think through this matter. Ephesians 4 and verse 23. The Apostle says, after verse 17 no longer walk as the Gentiles walk, notice, in the vanity of their mind, darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardening of their heart. You did not so learn Christ, he says, now verse 23, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. There is to be a constant work of renewal, constantly unlearning man's thoughts and the world's thoughts and learning God's thoughts and God's ways with my heart set upon having a life shaped and molded by the Scriptures. That's the first characteristic of the narrow road that leads unto life. Now, if that's going to be true of me, what must I do? Well, it's interesting. The Beatitudes begin, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. 
And it's in the plurals. Oh, the blessednesses of. The blessednesses of. There's another place where God says that. Psalm 1. Oh, the blessednesses of the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers or mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season, and his leaf shall not wither. Let me ask you, you spend more time in front of your TV than in your Bible. You spend more time tracking down all the nonsense that is spewed out over people's Twitter accounts and YouTube and my face and your space and all the other nonsense of electronic gadgetry. Where do you spend your time? Grab a book with a little five-minute devotional, but a half hour, an hour a day spent tracking down who said this, who's saying this on this blog, on that blog. My friend, if you're on that narrow road that leads to life, you have this determination, this resolute commitment that my mind is going to be shaped by God's Word. Not by the world's perspectives, not by my peers' perspectives, but by the word of the living God. That's the mark of one who is in the way that leads unto life. The way of resolute determination to have all of life shaped by the word of our prophet the Lord Jesus. That's why Paul could say in Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. How is it going to dwell in me richly if I don't read it seriously, continuously, habitually, determined to set aside all the other things that clamor for my eyes and my ears? Your eyes and your ears are the two great inlets of your soul. And if you're not using them to know the ways of God, how can you know the blessedness of Psalm 1 in your life? But then secondly, this narrow way is the way of resolute determination to cling to Christ alone as the ground of my acceptance with God. There at the gate... We repudiate our own righteousness. And we say with Paul, I count it all but refuse. But the human heart is fundamentally a heart that wants to turn away from the grace of God. And Paul had to write to the Galatians and say, Oh foolish Galatians, who has spooked you? Who has bewitched you? I set Christ before you vividly, before whom Christ was placarded, crucified among you. How is it you've turned away from trusting Christ alone to trusting in Christ plus circumcision, Christ plus Jewish dietary laws, Christ plus special Jewish feast, feast days? Oh, Galatians, what has happened to you? You got through the gate saying Christ and Christ alone is the ground of my acceptance with God. If you're to live the Christian life, you don't go on for something beyond Christ. You go deeper into Christ. It was not a babe in Christ who wrote Philippians 3, who said, my passion as a mature Christian, soon to go to heaven, is what? that I may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own which is of the law, but the righteousness which is from God by faith, the righteousness in union with Christ. And so the narrow road is that road in which in spite of all the tendency of our remaining sin, in spite of all the kind of teaching that would seek to draw us away from clinging to Christ and Christ alone, we're determined to say, I got into the gate by clinging to Christ alone. I am to live upon the way by clinging to Christ alone. 
And when I lie on a deathbed, if I have a deathbed, it will be dying, clinging to Christ alone. That's the narrow way. There's so many influences within and without to cause us to trust in something else. And it's amazing to me as an old man who's been a Christian now for 55 years. 57 years. You get this old, you can't even keep your math straight. To see how people turn aside and add this to Christ and that to Christ and this to Christ and that to Christ. We must say, no, Christ alone is the ground of my confidence That's why Jesus said those very strange words that caused offense to people in his day. But they're very important words. I want us to look at them in our own Bibles. John chapter 6. After the Lord fed the 5,000 and talked about the fact that God fed the people in the wilderness with manna, but the true manna has come down from heaven Listen to these strange words of the Lord Jesus in John 6, beginning in verse 54. John 6, 54. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Do you want to have eternal life? You will only get it by eating and drinking Christ. Eating his flesh, drinking his blood. This has nothing to do directly with the Lord's Supper. The Lord has no physical bread in front of him. He has no wine, no fruit of the vine in front of him. What's he saying? He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood, I'll raise him up at the last day. He's on the narrow road that leads to life. And I promise him resurrection life in the last day if on the way he continually eats my flesh and drinks my blood. What is that? Well, the Lord tells us right in this very passage. It's the acting of faith. It's the continual actings of faith. That's why in this very section, he says, He that believes on me has eternal life. Him that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Part of ongoing faith in Christ is by faith appropriating the virtue of his suffering, the breaking of his body, the shedding of his blood, we do not simply embrace him as our great priest at the gate. We continue to feed upon him as our crucified and risen Savior, constantly acknowledging our only access to God is on the basis of our great high priest at the right hand of the Father, continually pleading the cleansing of his precious blood. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We go to heaven as miserable sinners still in need of a perfect Savior. That's why the way, again, is a narrow way. Because there is that in our hearts that would move aside from embracing Christ alone, Christ plus nothing, as the basis of our acceptance with God. Then thirdly, if at the narrow gate we repudiate self as the governing principle of life, what is the narrow way? It is the way of constantly, resolutely determining that I'll live a life of self-denial as the governing principle of my life. I will not turn to a life of self-centeredness. I will reaffirm the repudiation of the gate daily. That's why Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross 
daily. And for a Palestinian Jew, what did taking up the cross mean? You saw a man walking down the street with a cross on his back. He's going to die. Whatever his plans were ahead of time, those plans are all gone now. He's going out to die. Jesus said, you want to be my true disciple? Then you must say no to self and daily die to your own plans, to your own wishes, to your own desires, and you are to live unto me. Take up the cross, deny self, and follow me. I want you to look at a very significant passage in the New Testament that shows this is the way every true Christian lives. Romans chapter 14, where Paul is dealing with the subject of Christian liberty. He makes this statement, and it's true of every true believer. Verse 7 of Romans 14. For none of us lives to himself, and none dies to himself. Now notice he doesn't say, none of us ought to live to himself, and none of us ought to die to ourselves. No, he said it's a fact. If we are a true Christian, we do not live unto self, we do not die unto self. Whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. And why is this true? Because this is what Christ died for. To this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and of the living. Christ died that when the crown is taken off your head and placed on his head, it will remain on his head from the gate to glory. We don't live to ourselves. We don't take the crown off his head, put it back upon our own. No, if we're on the way that leads to life, we are living unto him, not unto ourselves. The only valid proof that you've embraced Christ not only as your prophet to teach you and your priest to forgive you and intercede for you, but as your king to govern you, is that you no longer live to yourself. That's it. Very simple. No longer living unto yourself. No man, none of us who is a true Christian lives unto himself. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. So, with respect to what will I consider innocent entertainment, my television, my iPod, my MP3 player, every one of these electronic gadgets that contains information, music, something that comes into my ears or my eyes, if I'm a true Christian, I want it filtered through the Lordship of Christ. Would Jesus Christ be pleased with what I'm listening to? Would Jesus Christ approve of what I see? Would Jesus Christ approve every area of life? And it's not a burden, because he said, my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. He does impose a yoke upon us. He says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. You labor under the tyranny of self. I'll relieve you of that tyranny. Come unto me, I'll give you rest. But then he says, take my yoke upon you. What's a yoke? It's that instrument that bound two animals together to plow in the same direction, or a man placed over his shoulder to carry a burden. In either case, he says, take my yoke upon you. Be yoked to me. You're going to move where I move. You're going to think as I think. You're going to indulge what I approve and what has my smile. That's the mark of someone who's on the way that leads unto life. Do I take that next bit of food into my mouth? What is Christ's will? God puts the glutton and the drunkard in the same category. What goes in? Minus what goes out. Minus what's burned up stays on. 
And I have no right. This body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And I'm commanded to glorify God in my body. Do I glorify Him by loading my body with so many extra calories that I put a strain upon my heart, make myself liable to diabetes? Is Christ's Lordship over your mouth? Not only what you say, but what and how much you eat. It's just that practical, folks. If Christ is Lord, I don't eat to myself. I don't sit to myself. I don't read to myself. I don't listen to anything to myself. I want in everything that I shall please my Master. Then fourthly, if at the gate there is this repudiation of sin as our willful practice in life, what's the mark of the narrow way? Well, it's the way of resolute determination. Now notice carefully what I'm going to say. To avoid sin, to mortify sin, and to cultivate Christ-like graces. If sin and I had a real divorce at the gate, the proof that I'm in the way, the way of holiness and sanctification, is that I seek by the strength of Christ to avoid occasions of sin, to put sin to death, and to cultivate the graces of likeness to Christ. Right here in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said one of our petitions should be what? Lead us not into temptation. Lord, help me by your power to avoid the situations where I'm tempted to sin. And what about the things where the sins actually cling to me? Romans 8.13 If you by the Spirit put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. If you live after the flesh, you shall die, Paul says. But if you continually by the Spirit put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. John Owen said, you and I must continually be killing sin or sin will kill us. But then that's not all. There will be the cultivation of Christ-like graces. 2 Peter 1.5 God has given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we may be partakers of the divine nature. 1 John 2.6 He that says he abides in him ought himself so to walk even as he walked. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. What are those but Christ-like graces? And this becomes a passion to us, that we want to be as much as we can be now, what we're going to be when God's done with us. When God's done with us, we're going to be just like Christ. We're not going to be God, we're going to be human beings. But the scripture says, whom he did foreknow, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Think of it. Here God gets us at the gate. And we are marred, scarred, twisted, grotesque image bearers. We're still image of God, but it's marred, it's twisted, it's grotesque, it's deformed. And when at the gate we say, Oh God, I repudiate the sin that has twisted me and marred me and scarred me and deformed me. And I want to be made into the likeness of your Son. That's why you set your love upon me and predestined me unto grace that when you're done with me, He will be the firstborn among His family in which the whole family will look just like Him. We'll have perfected spirits in deathless bodies and we will be like Christ. But all along the way from the gate till the time we die or the Lord returns, God is doing that work of gradually conforming us to the likeness of Christ. Isn't that what we read about in 2 Corinthians 3 this morning? Paul says, we all, not just the apostle, all the Corinthians, we all, 
with open face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into that image from one stage of glory to another, even by the Lord, the Spirit. That's what this narrow way is. It is the way of avoiding sin. As we saw in the previous hour, sins as dear as right hand and right eye must be dealt with mercilessly. It is the way of putting sin to death using every single means to overcome besetting, clinging sins. As I mentioned in the previous hour, it seems that some sins are as much a part of us as our own skin, but we're ready to wage all-out warfare against it, and we are determined to be more and more like the Lord Jesus. This is what the writer to Hebrews meant when he said, follow after peace with all men and the holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Second Timothy 2.19, the Lord knows them that are his. Let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. There was an old Scottish theologian who wrote some very pithy statements. And one of them that I've never forgotten is this. His name was John Duncan. They called him Rabbi Duncan. He was so knowledgeable in Semitic languages, in Hebrew, etc. He said, nobody's perfect. Yes, nobody's perfect. Those words are the hypocrite's cushion. They are the true Christian's bed of thorns. You got this meaning? Nobody's perfect. Yes, that's true. Not yet. We're going to be. Not yet. We shall be. Those words, no true Christian says, nobody's perfect. Hey, you got your faults, I got mine. You got your spiritual warts, I got mine. You got your spiritual pimples, I got mine. So what's the big deal? Nobody's perfect. Those words are the hypocrite's cushion. They are the true Christian's bed of thorns. Because everything in me that's marked for perfection longs now for what I shall be then. You got it? When God brings us through the gate, He implants within us a passion to be as much as we can be now what we shall be when God's done with us. We're never content to be something less than what we shall be. Even though we know we'll not attain it in this life. Let me illustrate. Suppose I were to go home on Monday to my dear wife. And as we're talking, I say, you know, dear, I've been thinking. I'm never going to perfectly love you as Christ loved the church, even though I know God's told me that that's what I'm to do. So how about we settle for halfway? Dear, will you be content if I tell you my Bible says husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church. The even as is an equal sign. I'm the lover with a love equal to the love of Christ. And suppose I said, knowing I'll never attain that in this life, dear, I think I'll be satisfied with halfway. How about you, dear? You'll be satisfied with me being satisfied halfway? You say, you've got to be kidding. Yeah, I am. She wants to know that with all my heart, I'm seeking with all my might to love her as Christ loved the church. Even though she knows and I know I'll never attain it in this life. Carry that on to your relationship to Christ. In this Sermon on the Mount, what does he say? Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Matthew 5.48 I didn't say it, Jesus did. He said, be perfect. Even as your heavenly Father is perfect. And the true Christian says, Oh God, if I could be that in the next second, I'd cut my nose off. If that's what I had to do. I know I won't. But with all my heart I want to. And I'm serious about pursuing it. By every means that God puts at my disposal. Therefore, now we're going to get down to meddling. When my wife says... And she does with me. When she says, Al, we've got to talk. I know something serious is coming. We've got to talk. So we sit down to talk. 
And she'll say, I've been thinking about thus and thus and praying about it. And then she points out an area where I'm not being like Christ. What do I do? Do I defend myself? Do I bristle? Do I say, yeah, but you got this? If I'm pursuing being like Christ, I'm going to welcome that means of my wife helping me to see a character trait that is not like Christ. And I'm going to thank her for being an instrument in the hands of the Holy Spirit to help me to pursue likeness to Jesus. You husbands, do you welcome your wives? Maybe she's not the most tactful sometimes. Maybe she's a little bit uh, strident. In the but the issue is, is she pointing out a valid concern? Then listen to her. Say, I'm on my way to be like Christ. God's put you here, woman, to help me. And though I don't like what you just told me, it's true. Let's pray and ask God to help this thick-skinned Boorish, insensitive man to get his act together in this area. And how about you wives? Do you welcome the input of your spouse? How about your kids? When mom and dad sit you down, do you say inside, oh boy, here they are on my case again. Or do you say, Lord Jesus, I love you, I want to serve you, and you put mom and dad over me to help me to be like you. Give me a heart. To welcome what mom and dad have to say to me. Dear people, this pursuit of holiness that is the mark of those on the narrow road, it's very practical stuff. It's not airy fairy float up in the sky stuff. It's down here in the stuff where we live. And Jesus said, the way to life is through the gate and on the narrow way. Then for fourthly, or fifthly, it is the way of resolute determination to resist the attempts of the world to seduce us and to mold us. At the gate we said to the world, look, I've been enmeshed in you, I've been married to you, I see that you with all those married to you are on your way to outer darkness, I repudiate the world, I throw the ring away and I enter the narrow gate. Now what is the posture of my heart? A resolute determination that I will by the grace of God more and more shed the thinking of the world. And when the world proposes its thinking, this is what Paul meant in Romans 12. Listen to his words carefully. I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable to God which is your reasonable service and in that posture of utter yieldedness to God out of gratitude for His grace what comes next? Be not conformed to this world but be continually transformed how? By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove, that is, in your own experience, put to the test what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. I must be determined that I will not allow the world to squeeze me into its mold. You see, the world doesn't like getting divorced. And when at the gate you say to the world, you and I are divorcing, you take the ring off and throw it away, the world says, I didn't like getting jilted. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sneak around the other side of the gate. And when John comes through, having come through that gate and repudiated me, I'm going to try to seduce him back into a relationship with me. And so the world bears her fine and her voluptuous breast and puts on her most seductive voice and says just a little dalliance that's not a dirty minded old man using that imagery that's the imagery of the Bible James chapter 4 and verse 4 says don't you know that friendship of the world is enmity with God and how does James address these people flirting with the world he calls them adulteresses it's spiritual adultery to give my heart back to the world when I've divorced the world and been united to Christ. 
And so, if I'm on the narrow way, I'm determined that I will not allow the world to shape and mold my thinking, but that my mind will be transformed, that I may prove the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. The world has its standards for what's important for ourselves, for our kids. It's standard for what you've got to have of stuff and things to be with it. The world has its standard for dress, entertainment, everything. The world has a very detailed Bible. And it's constantly reading out its standards to us. And we need to consciously resist it and pray, Lord, help me to have my mind renewed that I would not be conformed to this present world. Now, my question is this. If what I've set before you, quoting any number of verses, if that's the way to heaven, you see why Jesus said, few there be that find it? Where are those professing Christians in whom there is undeniable evidence of these five elements of that narrow, compressed way? Those in whom there is undeniable evidence that they are indeed determined to think God's thoughts after Him having repudiated man-made thoughts about reality and truth, those that are seriously pursuing Christ as their final prophet? Where are those who are continually glorying only in the cross of Christ, who say with the Apostle Paul, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Where are those professing Christians in whom it is evident that self has been repudiated and that with all their hearts they're seeking to live unto Him who died for them and rose again? Those Christians who keep a tender, sensitive conscience. Sin is an ugly thing and the consciousness that I'm not perfect is their bed of thorns. When they read Romans 7 they can enter in with all of their hearts. When I would do good, evil is present with me. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? How long, Lord? And where are those Christians who are determined that they shall not be conformed to this world, but by the grace of God continually transformed, that they may prove the good and acceptable and perfect will of God? I closed my sermon this morning by reading a quote from Charles Spurgeon. I come up some years now, and this paragraph I want to read to you comes from Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, that prince of preachers of half a generation ago, and this is what he wrote in his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount after preaching on this very thing. Even when a servant of God describes the narrow way to professing Christians, they heed him not. But they charge him with teaching salvation by works and bringing souls into bondage, knowing that the gospel is the handmaid of the law and not its enemy, saving faith not only trust in Christ, but follows him. It not only believes God promises, but obeys his precepts. Saving faith is a fruitful thing, abounding in good works. It enables its possessor to endure trials, resist the devil, overcome the world. None tread the narrow way, save those who make vital godliness their chief concern, the main business of life. Hence we see why it is that the vast majority of our fellow men and women, yes, and professing Christians also, will fail to reach heaven. It's because they prefer sin to holiness, indulging the lust of the flesh to walking according to the Scriptures, self to Christ, the world to God, the broad way to the narrow. They are unwilling to forsake their sins, destroy their idols, 
turn their backs on the world and submit to Christ as Lord. Jesus knew what he was doing when he gives this gracious invitation to enter the narrow gate and walk upon this restricted way by giving the warning. I tell you this, he says, because there is a wide gate, an easy alternative, easy Christianity. Stuff a few thoughts about Christ in your head. Say a few words with your lips and you're in. No, that's the big wide door, not the narrow gate of true Holy Spirit wrought conviction. And then they conjure up a theory of the Christian life in which you can be saved but not surrendered. You can be justified but not sanctified. You can have Christ as Savior but not as Lord. You can be going to a heaven where holiness reigns while holiness is not the passion here on earth. That's the big wide road of bogus Christianity. And it's promulgated by false prophets whom Jesus warns about. Beware of false prophets. Anyone who tells you there's a way to heaven other than this narrow, constricted way is a false prophet. Don't believe him. Don't believe him. And make sure that you are determined to put yourself under and keep yourself under a ministry that continually reminds you the way is narrow. The gate is narrow. The way is restricted and pressured and constricted. But bless God, it leads to life. And my final note is this, and it's vital. When we come through the gate of true biblical conversion, in that work of God bringing us through the gate, we are united to Christ by faith, and by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, so that we are not called upon to walk that narrow road in the strength and impoverished resources of our own native humanity. The Scripture says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for God is at work in you, both to will and to work. For his good pleasure. Christ said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me you can do nothing. Abide in me and I in you. And in that relationship of communion with me and pleading with me on the basis of my words, you abide in me and my words abide in you. You will ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. God has taken the initiative to get us through the gate, and He continues to take the initiative to bring us along the way. I love that verse. He is at work in me to will and to work for His good pleasure. Let's put it in the concrete. Here I am before a temptation, something that has been a besetting sin, and I recognize it. And I say, oh God, help me to say no to that. Help me to turn from that. And we are conscious that we exercised our wills. And it was as painful as cutting off a right hand, gouging out a right eye. And when we have conquered, we don't then turn around and pat ourselves on the back. We say, thank you, Lord. You gave me the will to turn from that sin. And you gave me the power. He works in us both to will and to work. But he doesn't do it in such a way that we're just kind of like passive floppy dolls. Oh Lord, work. No, no. We have to cut and gouge and cast away. But when we have, we don't pat ourselves on the back. We look back and say, Lord, you worked in me to will and to work for your good pleasure. Lord Jesus, without you I can do nothing. It was your grace that I said no to that extra piece of pie that I know I shouldn't eat to the glory of God. And when we've done it, we say, Lord Jesus, thank you for putting in me both the will and the power to do. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? We work. But it's by, as Paul said, we strive according to his working, which works in us mightily. Well, who strives, Paul, you or the Lord? He said, I strive, and the Lord works in me mightily. 
He's a braggart, you know. He says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things. Wait a minute. You can do all things? Yes. All things that the will of God demands of me. 